Welcome back, everybody. Let's go. Be another beautiful weekend. Christmas special. <laughs> Let's go. Welcome back and welcome to Stig Shift Christmas special. How quickly time goes by. I can't believe it's December. The year is over already. Wow. Yeah, looks like the boys are hard at work. This wasn't my aircraft. I just saw the guys working hard already. I just walked over to take a look. Quick little side note. You see that thing right there with all the white stuff on it? That thing is called the FCOC, Fuel Cooled Oil Cooler. It's a heat exchanger. The big circular portion over there, that houses a big filter inside. The white stuff that you see is developer or leak detector. They must have changed the filter a while back and they kind of spray the stuff on there. They run the engine and they look for leaks. It's just one way of detecting leaks, but it's no harm to the engine. Now for the reason they had this opened up. Let me introduce you to the HP valve. Bear with me here. I got to explain this in a bit of a detail here. There's about three primary valves at work here and they all work together. The PRV, the pressure regulating valve, which is up top. The IP, the intermediary pressure stage and the HP, high pressure stage. All these valves work together to make sure there is no pressure loss within the compressor. So for example, at low engine speeds, when the pressure from the IP stage is insufficient, air is automatically bled from the higher compressor stage, the HP stage. This happens typically at some aircraft holding points and during descent. Fancy way of saying engines at idle. So this particular valve, the HP valve, is typically closed when the aircraft is flying. And that was the problem. That's what the inbound write-up was. Valve became open or stuck open in flight. Which is okay, the engine can still compensate. But when it came down to the ground and we were analyzing the issue, they found out that it is malfunctioning. So we had to put it on MEL, minimum equipment list. Basically, we're deferring it. To defer it, we had to lock it into closed position. Now, that gives some restrictions to the engine parameters, but still does not keep it from running. Now that I got everybody nice and confused, come on, keep on going. Cylindrical component right there is called the VSV actuator, variable stator vane actuator. It's attached to a ring that goes into the compressor section and it moves around or modulates compressor blades. This prevents the engine from stalling, basically regulating the proper airflow through the compressor, creating optimal compression. There's that PRV valve I was talking about earlier. They all finished up and I was just helping them out, close the engine. Okay, enough of the technical mumbo jumbo. Let's keep on going. We've got a long day ahead of us. Oh, check it out. Look what came in. This is our, uh, one of our new, brand new 737 Maxes. One uh, big difference between the 737 Max and the NG, the nose gear sits a lot taller. Well, not a lot taller, but about, I think if I remember correctly, when they went through the differences class, nine or 12 inches. A quick correction, I found out eight inches taller. There you go. It's, it's to compensate for the, the engine because the engine is so massive. So the nose gear is a little bit higher. I'm just waiting for my 777 to come in over there. I'm gonna do an ETOS check, but a nice little moment to admire the 737 Max. The lovely uh, CFM Leap 1B, the sister engine to the CFM Leap 1A that's on the 321 Neo. And it's got the indicative uh, lovely chevrons for noise reduction in the back, like the 787 GENX engine. Yeah, this thing's brand new. There you go. Nice, beautiful look for you in there. Clean. Super clean. Pretty airplane. We don't get these much over here. Once in a while, I'll come in. There you go, take a screenshot. That's as clean as it gets. Notice no spoiler mixer unit? That's right, it's fly-by-wire now at that portion. The rest of the aircraft is still direct control, cable driven. Spoilers are now fly-by-wire on the Max. But everything else is pretty much the same. You see that little nipple that's sticking out? Now, I've mentioned this before, and I told you guys to look it up, but I'll explain it right here. 
This is called the frangible fitting. So let's say on takeoff, you had a wheel or a tire that's deteriorated or damaged and it's trying to get retracted back into the landing gear or the wheel well, I should say. Pieces of that damaged tire will hit that little frangible fitting and shear it. Once that happens, the pressure from the main landing gear actuator gets removed. This will stop the retraction sequence to prevent any kind of damage occurring within the wheel well to all those components. At that point, the landing gear will just drop right back down and lock itself into a down lock position so they can land safely. Just another safety feature. Lovely design. Obviously the APU exhaust is different now. Only one hole instead of two holes. And the intake has also changed. Now they got this massive door. The change of design came because of rerouting of ducting. On the NG models, you had two holes in the back. One was for the APU exhaust and the other one was called the eductor. It was for the APU oil cooler and compartment cooling. On the Max, it's still there, but they just rerouted it and put it right next to the inlet. Look close at the inlet door. You'll see it split right there. One for the APU inlet and one for the eductor. That's going to be your outflow valve. This is what regulates the pressure inside the aircraft. On the ground, it's always open because you don't want to pressurize the aircraft on ground. But when flying, it closes off and regulates the air pressure coming out of the aircraft. Flow valve, if you were wondering what that was. But anyway, again, I'm just, uh, that's not my bird. I'm waiting for my airplane to roll in. But it's always nice to admire this one. Uh, brand new, brand new. It hasn't even discolored yet. Usually when it gets older, it turns brownish and rusty. But this thing is very new. Beautiful. Notice, all the way, all the lights now are in the wing root. No more on the belly. No more lights on the belly. And no more lights up front either. So they put all the taxi lights, takeoff lights, turn off lights. Everything is at the wing root. See, even the light over here is gone. And usually on the 737 NGs or other models, you'll see them right here. But yeah, it's pretty nice, very lovely. Always nice to see a brand new clean airplane. Here's something cool for you. All right, see on the ray dome? See those stripes right there? This is a quick reference to the previous video I made about the museum that I went to. And I showed you guys a small little Learjet on the ray dome. It had little stripes, right? Little static dissipators. Well, here it is. This is what it looks like on the big jets. Those are called lightning diverter strips or static dissipators. There's lots of sensitive equipment inside the radar, such as the glide slope, weather radar, localizer. These strips prevent damage to all that sensitive equipment. In case there was a lightning strike or some kind of a static buildup on the airframe, these will absorb it and decrease lightning energy and transmit it to the airframe, preventing any kind of damage. There's a lot more involved into this because there's also things called bonding straps. Check that out. Here she is. Finally came up from the hangar. All right. Time to get to work. A quick little walk around, cargo's interior. Should be fun. I don't remember who was asking, but somebody said, what are these hoses running up from the jet bridge to the belly of the aircraft? That's preconditioned air. That's how aircraft can get air conditioning on the ground without running the APU. It just saves fuel. That's about it. Here, I'll show you closer. They haven't turned them on yet, so that's why it's not inflated. Oh yeah. Whew. Yeah, it's a beautiful day.
a quick inspection of the cargo pits because this is an ETOPS check. And that thing is big. I could do laps inside there, back and forth. <laughs> Here we are, back in our 777. Everything looking good. The parameters are looking good. There is a fault over there that is for window heat, but it's already on deferral. It's already on MEL, but you know. As I've mentioned before, MEL, minimum equipment list, look that up. Guys, airplanes can fly with things that are not functioning because it has a redundancy system. Just because we don't have the time or the capacity or even the parts to fix it on site, but it will get fixed eventually. They are very limited items, time sensitive items. So we are monitoring, we are tracking this kind of stuff. We don't have time to play around with that. We gotta make sure the rest of the airplane is good. <laughs> My favorite. My little pet peeve when people don't put that back properly. <laughs> it's all right. Continuing on with the cabin inspection, I look for this as well. Not all seats have these. See that little green light? That actually means something. That designates if the seat is in full and upright position. It's like a little tattletale to the flight attendants. Right above the green light, there's another indicator. That lights up blue. That's there to tell you if you're plugged into the power port of the seat. So when I tell you to put your seat upright and disconnect any kind of electrical equipment, there it is. They will know if you don't do it. <laughs> okay, just got done with the interior, but I was walking by. So this is a bottle wine opener, basically. It's a bottle wine opener, but that's not what really fascinated me. This is what fascinated me. Seriously? Who in their right mind did this? Tri-wings? I haven't seen a tri-wing since an L1011. <laughs> that's just nuts. They put tri-wings. Day turns to night, here comes the next one. A beautiful 787. Here we go, next office. I just got done oiling it. Look at the similarities between the 737 engine and the 787 engine. Same type of Chevron, or Chevrons. Again, for noise reduction. Nice view of the blocker doors. Right there. There you go. Ain't that pretty? Daily dose of GENX. And just like I promised you guys, uh, an example, another example of the static dissipators right there. This is on the 787. See the strips? Same thing. We saw, we saw in that video, all airplanes have them. Well, all major airplanes have them anyway. Yeah, sorry for the bad quality. I guess not enough good lighting here. But right, you get the point. Nice quick little walk around, make sure everything's A-OK. -okay. Hey, go take a peek upstairs. You tell me, how's everything look? Help me out. <laughs> you can do the walk around with me. Oh, Wheel stoppers, right there. Boy, oh boy. Sometimes I swear, schedule is unpredictable. It's already pushed back. I thought we were gonna work this one because we thought we are gonna do an ETOPS on this that's gonna go out to Haneda, but uh, they changed it up. Now they want it off the gate. It's like this all the time. Sometimes schedules just run around and change, but overall, the logbook is clean. I'll go through the parameters, but they uh, they are going to take this to the hangar and then they're gonna bring it back again. Eh, it is what it is, not a big deal. One thing about aircraft schedules, they could change in a second. I have seen a whole schedule change four times within 15 minutes. Just trying to keep up with that is insanity on its own. It could happen because of weather, a broken airplane, let's say the crew didn't show up on time, the gate wasn't available, external equipment breaking down, there's just multitude of things that could happen. Hence, sometimes you take delays, yeah. As always, the usual. Just going through the parameters, making sure everything's okay, looking at faults, inbound effects, all the fun stuff. But right, once again, oh, don't worry. If you see stuff like this, Boeing likes to throw out so many messages 
for no reason. Well, there is a reason. That's just the way. Let me clarify. Uh, the architecture is so diverse between Airbus and Boeing. The information is there, but how it's presented is very different. Boeing will give you all the information. For example, if the hydraulics are not running, Boeing will tell you hydraulic system low pressure, and it will give you some kind of a status or advisory message. It will also kick up faults within the parameters and saying not active. For the simple reason, it's because it's not active. Hydraulics are not on. But when you take a look at Airbus, Airbus says, you know what? I don't need to clutter your screen with all this information. Airbus says, I'll make it more simple. I will just tell you when something is wrong. Just because your hydraulic pumps are not running, I don't need to throw up an advisory message. But if your, let's say, hydraulic system falters or something malfunctions, then I'll give you the indication. That's the difference. That the faults are not even active. Uh, it's interesting. Oh, here's a fun one for you. They got a really handy dandy laptop. Actually, early every one of our airplanes comes with a laptop. You can connect the laptop to the aircraft and perform every kind of maintenance task and test. It's got all the manuals on there. It's fun. When I said all of our airplanes, I meant all of our 787s come with a laptop. There you go. onto a 777, and have you ever noticed the tail of the 777 and how it's shaped different? Here we go again, I'll stay. can't you just shut up and let people watch? Nope, you're gonna listen, you're gonna learn. So, this is a Boeing 777, and what you're looking at is the exhaust portion of the APU, as well as the tail section, or the tail cone. So the primary reason it's made like this, or designed like this, is to slightly reduce drag. Not only does it reduce drag, but since the aircraft is such a massive bird, it creates a lots of wake turbulence. That's also why they design like that. It's to reduce wake turbulence. Well, guess what? This wasn't the first airplane to have this kind of design. If you ever seen a MD-80, a 717, or even a uh, MD-11, same exact design on tail cone. And another added benefit, I don't know if this was in the design of it or they thought about this, but the exhaust is actually pointed in the left side of the aircraft. The APU exhaust I'm talking about. The working side of the aircraft is the right side because all the cargo doors are on the right side. So it basically diverts the noise away from the ground crew. It just you know makes it a nicer environment. But I don't know if that was actually thought about or if that's a thing. I just heard that before. But overall, the whole point of that tail is for aerodynamic purposes, just to make it a streamlined bird. Otherwise, we're just finishing up our walk around. Nice view of the 777 main landing gear. The, what's the commonly known name for that thing? Uh, the Bigfoot, that's what it is. It's funny. This particular 777 is a Dash 200 and our fleet is equipped with a Rolls-Royce Trent 800. Unlike United, United likes to equip theirs with their Pratt & Whitney 4000s, which I'm sorry, I have to tell you, I can't stand that engine. Pratt & Whitney, please don't hate me, but if you are placing your oil tank in your hot section, that's just insanity. Like why, dude, why? To anyone that's ever worked on a Pratt & Whitney engine, they'll understand this. Trust me, I don't, I'm not a hater of Pratt & Whitney. I like it. It's just the design of it. It's not very maintenance friendly. And trust me, I've worked a Pratt & Whitney 4000 for many years. To any of my mechanics that are out there, tell me how much fun is it to change out to 2.5 bleed valve or the 4.9 bleed valve? Yeah, uh, broken fingers and lots of scars. Okay, I'll stop. I'll shut up. Sorry. Anyway, this day is over. On to the next one. Let's go. Welcome to the next morning and a fun little message to all of you right there. Good morning. You can type pretty much almost anything into the MCDU. Kick the tires and light the fires. Let's go. We gotta get this bird ready. We gotta get it right. Never a dull moment. Let's go check out the cabin. <laughs> uh, early in the morning. It's okay. There's a little clip right here that sometimes pops out. Not a big deal. We'll get that back in there. And this is why we walk through the cabin. I can guarantee you somebody just inadvertently bumped their head and just that thing just came down. It happens time to time. But this is why we do our walk arounds and walkthroughs. By the way, that little air vent, there's a special name for that. That's actually called a gasper. It's tied into the air vent ducts and it just gives you extra a little bit of air conditioning or air. And a little test of the lights, making sure everything's okay. And ding. Alrighty, let's go. Next office. Alrighty. 
quick little walk around, make sure everything's okay. Looking good, she's looking good. Let's see. This one's actually gonna go in the E-Tops. I think it's going to Kona. I'm not, I'll double check the schedule though. Look at that. Oh, this is a pretty cool one. Look at those fins. Do you see them right there? Right on the left-hand side on the inner barrel of the high bypass. Looks like a little combs, right? This is the CFM Leap 1A engine, and those are the engine surface air cooling oil coolers. It's an air radiator. It uses the cold air from the high bypass as it flows over to cool those fins, and those fins are attached to a subsystem to cool the oil. Let's see. Brakes and tires looking good, looking healthy. Oh, what's that? That don't look. Uh... You know, this is one of the things I always harp on. Attention to detail. Pay attention to the details. This is the cannon plug that attaches to the brake temperature sensor. Now, I pushed on it a little bit because it looked kind of weird. It didn't look right. And what I found out is the cannon plug is actually attached to the sensor. What got loosened up or dislodged was the back shell. This happens time and time due to vibration. Remember, these landing gear take immense amount of forces. Lots of vibration happening. And time to time, this happens. Here's a nice little view that pretty much almost nobody ever will ever see. Just like working on your Chevy, right? Huh. Uh, this is literally underneath the aircraft. I'm underneath the wheels, underneath the landing gear strut. I'm trying to expose that rubber shielding that's around it and get the back shell of the cannon plug reattached. I also did a thorough inspection on this, making sure the wiring is not damaged. No damage to the wires though. That's all I care about. Tighten this up, do a quick ops check, make sure all the parameters are good. Snug it up, not too tight. All secure. There you go. Easy. And we gotta send it with a little bit of love, as always. We'll go check the cargo pits, which you guys have seen a million times. I'm not gonna bore you with that. And we'll go upstairs. Okay, and we're here, and this is kind of funny. You know, I, I needed an operational check and just to make sure everything's working for the, the brake temperature sensor, but according to the manual, all you have to do is, yeah, literally just go to the wheel page. That's it. Energize the aircraft, which it already is. Just go to the wheel page. It's there, ops check good. <laughs> that was easy. Oh man. All of my findings get documented into the logbook and then have a corrective action towards it, according to maintenance manual. Okay, we are done. This one's ready to fly. But you know what, before we go, I haven't asked a question in quite some time. Let's ask you a question. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, let's look at the overhead and let's look at some of these push buttons, okay? All right, if you notice, some of these push buttons have little white circles within them, right? Some of these circles are up top, some of these little circles are at bottom. That's my question to you. Look, some up top, up top, some at bottom. That's my question. Tell me what those little dots or little circles indicate. What does it mean when they're on top? What does it mean when they're on bottom? This is a hard question. Try to dig, try to find that answer. All right, good luck. This genuinely is a very hard question. It's a very technical question. It's very hidden, but it is findable. You can find it online. 
Look, what I'll do is I'll put the answer at the end of this video, but it is a technical question. So just try to have fun with it. Try to find it. You know, it's fun working a diverse fleet. I run from Boeing to Airbus and different varieties of aircraft. It's, it's amazing. We got a beautiful Boeing 737 MAX rolling in. Having the pleasure of staying there and watching the beauty roll in, I also pay attention to the details. I am doing my walk around, believe it or not, even before I actually walk around. Remember when I said attention to detail? That's what this is. But it's also an enjoyable moment because you see something so beautiful roll in. Next office! We got a Max! Yay! <laughs> well, I wonder. I wonder if they, uh, if they still got the Corsair little uh, Easter egg. Yep, there. There it is. See it? I'll pause it for you so you can actually see it. Look close. Look very close. The power port receptacle for the ground power. You see the Corsair? That's an F4U Corsair. Go research that and actually find out. This is going to be fun for you. This is a little bit of an Easter egg on the 737. And pretty much all 737s have this in their ground power port receptacle. It's uh, quite interesting. <laughs> Don't go too far into the rabbit hole though. <laughs> Here we are. Here's what the 737 MAX looks like. The flight deck almost looks the same. A few things have changed. She's a beauty though. Look at those big old panels. Not often you get to see two giants crossing paths. The Airbus A380. It, this thing is literally a flying building. It's a work of art. It's an engineering masterpiece. Some may find it ugly, they call it the whale. But the thing is, it's still beautiful. But I guess I could say the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I look at the engineering aspect of it. I look at the mechanical aspect of it. This thing is just incredible. I personally have never worked on this bird, but I can always admire it. Fun little fact, even though it has four engines, only the inboard engines actually have thrust reversers. The braking system on this aircraft is so powerful that the engines only need two thrust reversers, not four. Being a tourist as always, let's enjoy G90 startup. Now this was quite comical. Now if you remember the beginning of this video, or I, I shouldn't say beginning, the beginning of this day, I started out with this aircraft. Literally, this was the airplane that I said good morning on, on the MCDU. It came right back to me. 
he went to Mexico and then came right back to LAX. It's kind of interesting to see the same airplane time to time. Anybody who ever wondered where all the waste goes, no, it never goes overboard. That is such a bad myth. It goes into the lavatory truck. And it smells horrible. I am staying away from that. Anybody that's ever worked on a cold station environment or cold weather environment and working with aircraft, this is a hack, basically, a life hack. You stand underneath the exhaust of the air conditioning and you get warmed up. Anyone that's ever worked on a ramp will understand this. A quick look into the intake of the pack system. The water that's spraying in there, that is basically to cool the heat exchangers. Here comes the last one for the night. Coming up from the hangar, and it's going out to Philly. I'm just gonna give it a one look over, make sure everything's okay, and send her on her way. A quick little peek at where the pilots sleep on the 787. They got two crew bunks. I've seen, I've shown this to you guys before. And the lazy boy, obviously. Watch your head. There she is, my darling. Ending this day on the beautiful 787. Just getting it ready. It just came up from the hangar. Just need to prep it and make sure everything's okay. But we're not done. On to the next day. Let's go. Good morning, everybody. Let's go. Plastics Princess is here. We left off with one yesterday. We're gonna start out with one again today. Gonna work this and send it to Haneda. Looking good. A little dirty on the inside. They all are, though. <laughs> oh, check it out. I don't even need my flashlight. Right here. Got its own lights. Pretty much all major aircraft have this narrow bodies and wide bodies, either the nose gear or the main gear, at some capacity. Not only do they have light switches, but they also have the capacity to extinguish the APU. If the ground crew sees that APU is on fire or anything else, then if the maintenance crew sees it, we can extinguish and deter the fire of the APU, basically having the capacity to turn it off. The rest of the switches are for gear doors up or down. Oh, look at that. Nice little blend. Well, not a blend, just probably they polished it off. There was probably a scuff there or a scratch. That's okay, it's normal. impact resistant door they're not actually doors 
what they are is access panels. They're access panels to the internals of the wing tank. And the internal of the wing tank is the fuel tank because the wing is your fuel tank. Now, why do they create these? Uh, there's many reasons. Uh, obviously, impact resistance because you don't want anything hitting the wing tank and causing cavitation. But most notably, you will remember the Concorde, the incident with the Concorde, where a debris hit the wing tank and it caused rupture. The primary reason for this is any kind of debris hitting those wing tanks and it will not cause a disturbance within the wing tank and prevent a fire. Not only preventing fire, but also preventing cavitation within the wing tank, which can cause a surge. And it's all across the wing. These, these panels are all across the wing. It's very interesting how to design the 787. The bulk cargo access hatch is on the left side instead of the right side of the aircraft. Usually access panels or cargo pits are on the right side. Interesting. Uh, let's go check out the bulk cargo and we can go inside the main aft cargo from the bulk as well. There you go. Does this remind you from that scene from that movie, Commando, where he's crawling through the cargo pit <laughs> into the wheel well on that, uh, I think it was a DC-10 or something like that. There's a cool little example of what the cargo pit looks like when a door is closed from the inside. Pretty cool, huh? inside the plastic princess this airplane is done guys um it's ready for e-tops it's ready to fly you know there's something really cool a cool feature that this aircraft the 787 has which has got to do with the fueling look up here this is the fuel panel where you have obviously left pumps right pumps center pumps the only reason that this little pump is not on but the pressure is going because the apu is running so it will automatically feed the fuel to the APU. So it's got a crossfeed function, but the really cool function is actually this button, the balance button. The balance button will automatically balance out the fuel for you. You don't have to go hit refuel, defuel, transfer switches, no valves, no nothing. Simply hit the balance button, bam, does it all automatic for you. It's so cool, makes it very easy. Watch, I'll show you. Look, the left tank is in slightly imbalanced with the right tank, just by 900 pounds, but watch this. Put those on, put the balance on, and watch what happens. And there it goes, it's gonna start transferring fuel. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really nice function. I'm not sure if any other aircraft have this. Uh, the only one I know of having this type of function is the 787. Um, yeah, pretty nice. Makes life easier. Oh, and the reason why the left tank is always draining faster than the right tank because the APU feeds off of the left tank. So that's why that pump, as I mentioned earlier, it, it's automatic. It'll, it'll always feed the APU fuel. Even though it's not on, it, it automatically kicks on. So, oh yeah. But when they're flying, all of these are on. I'll let that balance out. Since we're here, let's run through the rest of the pages. Here's your electrical page. 
hydraulics. You saw fuel already. Let's go look at the air. There you go. It gives you all the temperatures within all zones of cabins. It lets you know which cabin air compressor is working. Doors. Landing gear. Flight controls. Obviously everything is orange because no hydraulics are active. Ephus displays. Maintenance. This is where I get my bulk of my information. So if I would say I wanted to see more stuff on electrical, right? And give you more detailed information. Pretty cool. circuit breakers and I've told you before these are virtual circuit breakers or solid-state relays that's how they work anyway you can go by ATA number by, just by a variety of uh, search features you would basically go control, open, and that would pop open, it'll, it'll turn white. But we're not gonna need to do that, I'm just showing you. Also it gives you the data. Just a nice little example. This is a perfect example of taxi maneuvers. Now check this out. The aircraft in question is the 787. This is a wide body aircraft and look at the maneuvering. Notice that the gear turned, or the nose gear I should say, turned way beyond the line. There's a reason for this. The nose gear is behind the flight deck. You have to compensate for that. There's a wait period. I have taxied aircraft such as 747s, L1011s, 777s, 787s, and when you're taxiing aircraft this big and this massive, and when the nose gear is behind you, you have to wait. The rule of thumb is usually when you let the line or the taxi line pass your shoulder, that's when you start turning. The interesting part is that you really don't learn this in school. Uh, what you learn is on the job when they are training you. This is experience. Every aircraft have their own personality and they will move and act as they want to. You just have to adapt to them. I think one of my favorite aircrafts that I ever taxied was the A330. That thing was a Cadillac. Don't get me wrong, I love the 747. That thing was fun and solid as a rock. But the A330, oh my goodness. Just a Cadillac, smooth as butter. Just pushing the throttles up on that thing and the slight delay, but then the power behind it. Oh, beautiful. Next office. All right, back to the narrow bodies. This one stays here, so just gotta give it a little bit of oil. There you go. Then you're good. Seal good. Got the handy dandy pump today. Oh, could not for asking for anything better. Beautiful, clean post flight report. Logbook is clean. Beautiful. Alrighty. I think I've gone over this one, the triangles. Everybody knows about the triangles, right? This is on some Airbuses. Some Airbuses have them, some Airbuses don't. You do encounter these triangles. No, it doesn't mean the Illuminati. <laughs> They're actually visual key points to the wing. There are certain, they're facing either the leading edge of the wing and there's another set that's in the back that leads facing the trailing edge of the wing. So it's a visual cue point. Let's say if they needed to inspect or see what's going on out into the wing, if there was any, any kind of obstruction or damage, but, uh, Obviously, pilots are not gonna run out of the flight deck to come look over here. They'll probably have a flight attendant come take a look and relay the information. And most of the time, they, you actually use it for uh, de-icing. When they are doing de-icing, it's a good, another good visual area. 
But yeah, that's what these triangles are for. Just basically visual key points to the leading edge of the wing and to the trailing edge of the wing. So in case they needed to see what's going on. But yeah, I don't think there's ever been a history of a pilot running out of the flight deck to come out and look at these, but you never know. Yeah, that's, that's what those are for. Should be done here. Let's go on to the next one. Look at that. Beautiful sunset. Next office. This one came out with a little bit of a pack issue, but no problem. Check. Let me clarify, this aircraft came in with an issue that had to do with cabin temperature control. This is a 737-800 and sometimes these systems glitch. Unlike the Airbus where you can run a test throughout the flight deck and through the MCDU, you have to go downstairs into the e, e equipment bay and you have to go interface with the boxes itself. It's a bit more rudimentary and very simplistic. Uh, but the downside is obviously you have to go downstairs and go into the E&E bay, equipment bay basically. And here's a nice little look at what it looks like inside there. This is in the main equipment bay of the 737-800. Pretty much all 737s look like this. Uh, you got a bunch of control boxes or computer boxes. And right up top you have <laughs> those little plastic things are uh, water catchers basically. If there was a leak within the cabin it wouldn't drip down onto the primary control boxes. Again, simplicity at its finest. Right there you'll see the battery and right next to it is actually the oxygen bottle. This is all accessible through the forward cargo bay for the 737 NG. This, all the silver stuff that you see, that's insulation. Some ducting for cooling and just more components and wiring. As it happened, this was Christmas Eve, and uh, this is December 24th, and yes, a lot of people are working. Not everything is sunshine and rainbows within aviation, and we have to sacrifice certain things. We have to sacrifice friends, we have to sacrifice family. I wrote you all something for the occasion of Christmas. In the hangars draped with tools so bright, aircraft maintenance echoes throughout the nights. The line and the hangar's lights shimmer on the metal wings. Technician works, ensuring all safety of things. Precision and care, they inspect every part. Crafting reliability, a true work of art. So here's to those who keep aircraft in flight. Merry Christmas to all, and to all, a safe flight. Take care, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here and a Merry Christmas to you. I will see you on the next adventure. Goodbye.